Back in November, middle school teacher Richie Floyd disrupted nearly 100 years of precedent becoming Florida's only elected official who is openly socialist. The progressive reports that while he didn't hide it, Floyd didn't win his campaign for St. Petersburg City Council by labeling himself a socialist. Instead, he built a coalition of voters from across the ideological spectrum by focusing his campaign on real, tangible solutions for the working class, such as expanded public housing, job training programs, and a citywide fair scheduling ordinance. Here to discuss further is council member elect Richie Floyd. Welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. All right, so I, I'm the one person in our four boxes who is not such a, well, I don't mean to speak for, for Kim. I think I know Ryan's <laughs> views, but uh, not the hugest fan of, uh, of socialism. So I, how, I, I love the phrase openly socialist. <laughs> <laughs> Closeted socialist. So how, how, since you do self-describe that way, how do you, def, you know, for, tell our audience what that actually means? What it, how, do you de yeah. define, how do you describe yourself as a socialist? Um, I mean, I would describe myself as a democratic socialist. Uh, and I think what that means to me is uh, two things. One is creating a government that works for everyday people, uh, that serves the interest of everyday people and not uh, politicians, corporate backers or special interests. Uh, and two, it means, uh, you know, fighting to make sure that uh, working people have the uh, economic leeway, the economic um, input that they deserve. Uh, and that sort of goes to the core of what democratic socialism is uh, and is sort of democratizing the economy and giving people uh, more power in their workplaces. And one of the most... So Richard, yeah. No, go ahead, Kim. Well, I was, I was just wondering if you could give an example of what a democratic socialist would be, just so that everybody is clear. You know, the definition of socialism is so broad. I think so many people define it differently. Is there a country or, an, or maybe even an area of the country that you would consider to be operating under democratic socialism so we can have a better idea? I mean, we're all, everyone who watches this show is familiar with Bernie Sanders, and that's sort of, uh, his platform is what democratic socialism looks like uh, at a federal level. Um, for me, I'm, I'm focused on municipal politics and what does it look like when we build a, an economy and a city that works for everyone. Uh, and the city has a lot of leeway when it comes to things like housing, uh, labor, um, labor rights in the city, uh, and environmental regulations and, and, uh, and beyond as well. And so... Uh, I guess if I have to point to an example, um, you know, that sort of relates, I would say there are a plethora of cities that have prioritized um, different aspects of these issues. Uh, it could be in the United States, but it could be in, you know, the common examples like Scandinavian countries, European countries. But then there's good examples of uh, democratic institutions and organi organizing going on uh, across the world, particularly in uh, Central and South America as well at this time. And one of the most intriguing things to me in your in your platform was the, the thing that I mentioned at the top, which is you know fair fair scheduling. And so you know if if you're a if you're a shift worker, you know if you, if you work at a, a restaurant or any other job where your your manager is is setting your schedule, you know very often you have a, a matter of hours or days if you're lucky lucky to find out what your schedule is going to be for the next week. If you're lucky enough to get a schedule for the entire week, you might just get it for the next couple of days. And whatever the manager says, that's, that's when you've got to be in. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of your life. Doesn't matter what your childcare situation is. Doesn't matter if you bought ticket, tickets to the game or to this uh, concert. Doesn't matter if you've got, you, what, whatever was going on, forget it. Hey, boss says you're, you're, you're starting at 7 a.m. You better be there at 7 a.m. Uh, or you're fired. You're, you're proposing an ordinance that would require several weeks advance notice for a schedule. Uh, what kind of resistance are you getting from kind of the, the, the boss class in, in St. Petersburg to that? And do you think that you could actually get this uh, passed through the council? Uh, yeah, so as far as resistance we're getting right now, um, it's been minimal. I mean, I, I'm just being sworn in this week and uh, we haven't, you know, geared up our campaign completely, but I do anticipate some resistance. I think the reason why I believe it could be passed immediately, uh, maybe not immediately, but with some organizing around it, is because it's such an easy reform. You're just asking for someone to do something that they have to do already, which is make a schedule a couple right. weeks ahead of time to try to stabilize people's lives. And so, uh, you know, it's such a reasonable demand that it's something easy to organize some uh, around. Uh, and we've already organized a lot in this city, and I think it's definitely possible. And it's really important because, like you said, uh, you know, there's no way to schedule your life 
when you get your uh, work schedule at the last second. This is something that I've gone through personally. Uh, I like to say that this is my uh, fourth career. I spent a long time as a service worker, uh, as a student, and I worked at restaurants, and that was uh, actually the longest career that I've had now at this point. And, uh, you know, it was really difficult for me to be able to just visit with my family, um, schedule my doctor's appointments, uh, help take care of things that I had to in my personal life. And I believe this is just one step that we can go to give working people a little bit of leeway in their life to, uh, you know, have a little more control and, and stabilize things a little bit better. And it'll go a long way to uh, attracting employees from surrounding areas, uh, especially when right now it's a difficult place to be the service sector. Florida is a state that, you know, was was kind of up for grabs or, you know, right down the middle, um, electorally speaking, is now, I think, considered a much safer um, Republican state. You even had, you know, in, a, in an election that, that Trump lost uh, nationally. You had him do quite well in Florida, even sort of gaining some ground uh, with some uh, minority voters. You know, how do you, you, so you got elected in this state. How are you, um, you know, navigating those water? Are you, you creating like a new coalition? Are there, are there issues that bring together um, even people like in the Republican and Democratic camp or, or like get them out of that mindset? Um, that w that is like part of how you are talking to your 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 voters. Yeah, definitely. I think there's two things. Uh, first, I think that message is important, and uh, the message that my politics and the and the communities and people that I organize with uh, push forward is one that centers our economic plight in this state uh, and in this city. Uh, make sure that you know we're talking about. Uh, the things, the kitchen table issues, you know, do people have good jobs? Uh, do people have good opportunities at education? Uh, do we have a clean environment to live in and economic opportunity for everyone? And I think that really cuts across a lot of the nonsense um, and gets to the point about what people really care about in their lives. And I think that's really important in a politics that we've seen works in this state. Uh, when we go back and we look at uh, recent referendums and ballot initiatives that uh, we've passed in the state, at the same time that Donald Trump won uh, just over 50% of the vote here, the minimum wage, uh, $15 minimum wage increase got 60% of the vote, uh, over 60% of the vote. And uh, so you can see that, you know, the the parties and the politicians on the ballot aren't necessarily connecting to the issues that people in this state care about. And so that's one big thing. The other big thing is just grassroots organizing. Uh, the state of Florida is, you know, a transient state. A lot of people pay attention to it. Um, but it's attention at election time. It's money thrown in at the last second. We're doing real deep organizing here, uh, actually being part of the community in a way that uh, politics hasn't necessarily been in the state. Uh, we knocked on a lot of doors in our campaign. Uh, we won precincts uh, that voted Republican in every other way race and then voted for the most left-leaning candidate in our race, uh, the most left-leaning candidate in the city. And so we've shown that you know, really connecting to a community uh, and connecting to them about the issues that they care about uh, transcends a lot of these lines. And Florida is, if anything, a very working class place, a uh, large service sector, large agricultural sector, um, uh, based off of tourism. And, you know, there are a lot of working people here that haven't had their uh, politics and needs represented by the political class in a long time. And that's what we're trying to get back to. Well, congratulations on, on your win. And, uh, and good luck, you know, come back and let us know how, how, it go, how it goes, trying to get the agenda through the council. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of the show, so I really appreciate this, and I'll be happy to come back anytime and let you know how things are going. Great, thank and you. Thanks, and thanks for watching, and, and we will have more Rising right after this.